Hello, I'm back to talk some more about instrumental conditioning. And in this particular episode, I'm going to talk about things that uh, <laughs> nobody else talks about, or you don't frequently hear addressed. Okay, uh, we often think about Pavlovian conditioning and instrumental conditioning sort of being two main forms of conditioning. Uh, but in, and uh, in uh, Pavlovian conditioning, we often discuss the issue of what control should you use. Rarely talk about that in instrumental conditioning. I hope uh, you'll think a little bit more about that based on what you hear here today. <laughs> here, here today. If we may look at the first slide, uh, this is a reminder. Uh, this is something we saw, saw a long time ago. And um, it illustrates the fundamental learning experiment, which, as I argued earlier, involves uh, an experimental group that receives a training procedure, a conditioning procedure of some sort, and you see the gradual acquisition of responding. And then you have to compare that to a control group that doesn't show that effect uh, in order to satisfy the definition of learning. So we're often interested in what would the control group be? Uh, if we look at the next slide, uh, this uh, issue of what the control procedure should be has been you know, discussed in, uh, at great length and uh, it's pretty straightforward. The experimental group gets the condition stimulus paired with the US and the control group gets, what you're interested in is learning to associate the CS with the US. And so the control group gets both stimuli, uh, but in an unpaired fashion so that the association has, cannot be uh, established. So the uh, control procedure is a CSUS unpaired procedure. Yeah, the control procedure is not presenting the CS by itself or the US by itself. You have to present both stimuli but in an unpaired fashion. All right, so let's move on to uh, the next slide, which uh, raises the question, you know, what's the control procedure for instrumental or operant learning? Well, the experimental group, we're all agreed on <laughs> what the experimental group needs to be. Namely, here a response produces a reinforcing outcome illustrated by uh, the capital letter O. So what should be the control group? Well, in a lot of experiments, the control group is simply to measure the response before you introduce uh, the experimental procedure. And so it, uh, it, it would be a procedure that's listed as the second alternative on the, uh, on the uh, bottom. It's a response occurs and no reinforcer or no outcome occurs. Uh, if you followed the uh, pattern from Pavlovian conditioning, the control procedure should be one in which the response and the reinforcer are both allowed to take place, but in an unpaired fashion. Uh, that's rarely employed. Why do you need the unpaired? Well, to rule out sensitization effects of periodically presenting the reinforcer. Uh, the third alternative listed here uh, is a possibility that's occasionally used, but not very often, is where the response results in the omission or the canceling of the reinforcer. That is employed sometimes, but you don't see it very often. Now, most commonly, you don't see <laughs> control groups <laughs> in studies of instrumental conditioning. And on, anyway, let's go on to the next slide, which uh, <laughs> makes the problem even worse or illustrates that the, the issue of controlled procedures in operant or instrumental conditioning is, it, it, that issue is conceptually pretty difficult. Okay, so uh, this illustrates the instrumental conditioning procedure from a broader perspective and uh, actually the perspective that uh, Thorndike uh, initially employed and uh, that actually Skinner also adopted in, in uh, his uh, concept of a three-term contingency. 
That is, yeah, in a uh, instrumental conditioning procedure, uh, you make a response which results in a reinforcing outcome, O, which is uh, illustrated there with the wiggly arrow lines. But that response occurs in the presence of certain cues indicated by the capital S. And uh, uh, so there are three terms, the three factors involved in an operant conditioning procedure, S, R, and O. O, and there are a variety of different associations that can uh, be established uh, as a result of a procedure like this. One is the SR association, which is what Thorndike emphasized. Uh, another is the SO, so there's, uh, there's contextual cues S can become associated with the reinforcer. And uh, these uh, came into play uh, in a big way uh, and uh, and remain prominent in studies of so-called Pavlovian instrumental transfer, which are now often uh, employed in investigations of the role of uh, incentives uh, in uh, in drug addiction. Uh, and there is an RO association, and then there is the more complex S dash s r o association so if you uh, want to uh, uh, contemplate how to design a control procedure you have to ask yourself what are you controlling for are you controlling for sr learning are you controlling for so learning are you controlling for ro learning or are you controlling for that uh, more complex uh, associative structure listed um, below that. Well, here's the deal, folks. <laughs> I've never seen anyone raise this issue. <laughs> you know, often uh, and people ignore the question of whether you need a control group in operant conditioning, and even if they do raise that issue, they rarely focus in on, well, what are you going to be controlling for? Interestingly enough, there was a, a graduate student <laughs> at McMaster University who some years ago uh, was studying, trying to get pigeons to pick a key for food reinforcement. And uh, he decided to run a control procedure that involved just uh, uh, the SO association. Uh, so in this control procedure, the pigeons didn't have to peck a key in order to produce food, uh, but food occurred automatically following uh, stimulus S and under those circumstances. So that was a control procedure. And there was, so there's no contingency between pecking and food. Nevertheless, the pigeons started pecking, and that was led to the discovery of what we now know as sign tracking. So uh, it, that illustrates that you're going to learn interesting things if you include a control group in a study of instrumental conditioning. Uh, and unfortunately, people haven't learned that lesson because they typically don't think carefully if at all, about control procedures and instrumental conditioning. So I hope after today's comments, you will think carefully about that issue. And I wish you all the best. Till next time, take care. All righty.